Hello, and welcome to World Class, the series that brings you the finest of luxury hotels in some of the greatest destinations our planet has to offer. This time, we really are going up in the world to Zermatt, home of the Matterhorn, where the champagne is good, but the champagne powder is even better. But we'll come back to the fluffy stuff later in the program. Now, we come back down to Earth and get into the flow of the village itself. So, after arriving by electric train from the nearby town of Visp, it's straight onto our horse-drawn carriage and through the snow-filled streets of town to the glamorous Grand Hotel Zermatterhof. Situated high up in the Swiss Alps at an altitude of 1,600 meters, this town is an exquisite display of traditional Swiss architecture and modern-day eco-friendly travel. Well, it's out from the cold and into a very warm welcome by our friends at reception. But more on this lovely hotel later, as it's our first night and the snow has just started to fall. So what better way to work up an alpine appetite than some early evening window shopping? We probably don't really need to mention anything about Swiss watches, but hey, we thought we would just for good measure. So with hunger setting in, it's back to the hotel and the elegant Prato Borni restaurant. Things are heating up around here with one of the hotel's special flambés being created by the maitre d' Mr. Paul Schmidt. I'm the first maitre d' in this hotel. I start in 69, 1969 here, like the normally waiter. And I'm still here after 39 years. 39 or 40 years to go, it was a very old house. Some rooms with no bedroom. And uh, so we had to change everything. From the cellar up to the floors, so the five floors, we have to change everything. Also the restaurants. 30 years ago was an old dining room. We called it an old dining room. So now it's a nice, warm restaurant. In new state-of-the-art kitchens, head chef Rico prepares some more mouth-watering dishes. But how do they maintain high quality ingredients in such a remote mountain village? Fresh food out of fresh vegetables or meat, whatever, or fish kinds. It's the chef of the kitchen that's ordered us two times in a week. It comes from Zurich or it comes from Geneva. Fresh. If the train it goes, it's no problem. If the train it didn't go anymore, but if we have avalanches, something like that. So we have to call, or if it's possible, we have to call the helicopter, so we fly it in by helicopter. Well, this really does bring new meaning to the phrase meals on wheels. Your dinner has just arrived on the helipad, and don't worry, you can certainly be assured of getting your essential vitamins for your next ski run. As the next day dawns, it's time to go up the mountains, but not by helicopter on this occasion, but by the Matterhorn Express, so we can take in some of the wonderful views Zermatt has to offer. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. 
No subscription required. Zermatt, at the very beginning, beginning of 17th century, that was when first Zermatt was mentioned as Zermatt before it was Pratoborum, a Latin name uh, possessed by a monastery in Wisp. And uh, Zermatt became popular then in the uh, beginning of 17th uh, century when first British uh, scientists came to, to Zermatt to examine the flowers, the, the animals here, and of course to see, at, to look at the mountains. And at that time Zermatt was just a poor little village having a couple hundred inhabitants. And uh, yeah, the people, they were actually afraid of these uh, visitors coming because they had not a lot to eat. And they were afraid that these visitors, they take off, uh, take away all their uh, supplies they have for the uh, very hard uh, winter season. But soon they discovered then that uh, with tourism they can make uh, a lot of money, they can make an earning. And so Zermatt uh, began to change from a farmer's village to a tourism village like it is today. And today Zermatt has 5,600 inhabitants. Uh, but this is only the people who stay here all, all year long. When Zermatt is full with all the visitors coming from all over the world, then we have up to 35,000 people in the village itself. The first uh, actually mountain railway in, in Zermatt uh, was the Gornegrad train. Before people were transported, uh, by, uh, by, uh, they were carried up the mountains by the mountain guides. And then the Gornegrad uh, train was built in uh, 1898 and was the first uh, cable, or actually the first cogwheel train going up to the mountain. And this was a big exciting thing. And uh, even nowadays, uh, more modern with faster trains and uh, with uh, modern uh, cars you can sit in, uh, the Gornegrad is still one of the uh, most uh, popular exciting, uh, excursion points in Zermatt. So sit back and relax while you trundle just under 10 kilometers on this unique railway that really does transport you to the top in style. Passing over impressive bridges and going through a variety of tunnels in the midst of the forest and snow-covered meadows, this truly has to be one of the most enjoyable ways of ascending a mountain. But Zermatt is not only for the skiers and snowboarders, it offers something for everyone from ice skating to movie theaters, sledging to shopping, or simply partake in a glass of wine with a bite of lunch while taking in the breathtaking 29 surrounding peaks that stand 4,000 meters tall. Ah, our final destination appears before our eyes, perched on a high cliff top at 3,100 meters and an enviable vantage point to what appears to be guardian of the surrounding area. In several ways, the Kolmhotel Gornergrad is very unique. First of all, it's very old, built in 1907, over 100 years old. Then it is the highest hotel in the Swiss Alps. We have also very unique two observatories to watch into the stars. As the day trippers leave and the sun goes down, you have the mountain peak to yourself. And with no light pollution, the stargazing here is quite simply amazing. It was renovated in 2005. Today we have 25 rooms. Every room has a name of one of the mountains which we can see around here. And the number of the room is the altitude of the mountain. So Monte Rosa, for instance, has the room number 4633. There is another nice room into the, in the towers, which is called the Matterhorn room. Uh, both of these rooms you have an exceptional view, but of course from all the other rooms you can see the Matterhorn or the Monte Rosa or the amazing glaciers uh, on the foot of the Kulm Hotel Gornergrad.
Fernando explained to the world-class team that every full moon, they invite guests to dine on fondue and then take the opportunity to ski back to Zermatt purely under moonlight and in full awe of the Matterhorn at night. Well, it's time for us to go back down, but in daylight and not on the train. This time, it's ski time. And with more than 180 kilometers of marked trails to choose from, you certainly won't be short of runs to play on. You can even pop over onto the other side and ski into Italy to experience Servigna. But just don't forget what time the connecting lifts back close, or it could be an expensive taxi fare home. Well, the variety of, of possibilities is quite big in Zermatt. Of course, uh, if you have a the beginning ski areas, we have a total of three beginning ski areas where we have a kids area or also for adult beginners. Uh, we actually have also eight ski schools that uh, cater for, for these uh, needs. Uh, and then it goes all the way up to the very experienced skiers uh, who can use uh, the slopes, of course, quite steep slopes in the uh, Rotorn area, but also in the Hotali area. And what is certainly special in Zermatt is, is a lot of off-piste uh, possibilities. Oh yes, aside from trains and gondolas, there is another option of getting up the mountain, and that's putting your skis on and walking up. Hmm, maybe not for everyone. Well, the Matterhorn in Zermatt was always the thing. And that's also what Zermatt made big and that's why a lot of people from the whole world come, are coming to Zermatt. But the history of the Matterhorn actually started quite, or actually the history Matterhorn human started quite uh, uh, bad with a disaster. The, the Matterhorn was climbed first in 1856 uh, by a, a, a crew of seven people, four English guys, one a um, uh, French uh, guy and uh, two local guides and they reached the top just before the Italians could reach it from the Italian side so they celebrated themselves as winner and then when they came back on the way down they had an accident one of them was not a good climber he slept and one of the others started to fall and they were linked in one single rope and this rope broke after the fourth so four people they fall down all the way the north wall and they died the problem was uh, four of these guys, th uh, four of these dead guys, three were English. And uh, the Queen Victoria, when she heard from this bad accident, she actually wanted to introduce a uh, law for their people to forbid people to come in this area. But thankfully, that never happened. Because Queen Victoria had raised the awareness of how dangerous this great mountain is, more and more adventurers wanted to visit Zermatt to try to climb the Matterhorn. Thus, ironically, making the tourism industry here a complete success. As a reflection of this, the Matterhorn Museum was built underground. It recreates a mountain village consisting of 14 houses and tells the story of the history and tourism of Zermatt. The first major hotel to be built here was ours, and thanks to the no cars rule, looks the same in the old pictures as it does today. Timeless. This hotel is belonging to the Zermatt families. It has been constructed 130 years ago and all the old families of Zermatt are owner of this hotel. And uh, that means that it was built 130 years ago this hotel has five stars and uh, it's the size of the hotel. It's very familiar uh, despite it has 85 rooms, uh, 150 beds and so you are in a very familiar location. 
We know our guests by their name and many of our guests they return every year, some of them even two or three times a year and uh, this makes it very special. We have six large suites, medium suites and about 13 junior suites and they are in a very classical style but equipped with modern looking equipment like flat screens and uh, even the large suites have uh, computers inside, wireless LAN access, coffee machines, so they are very nice looking, uh, adequated to the time of today. The chalet suites are very romantic and uh, in a very old style but very modern looking and uh, we have very good uh, feedbacks of our guests regarding those suites. After a hard day skiing, one of the most welcoming facilities this grand hotel has to offer is its large pool and spa, managed by Rebecca Heckendorn. The pool is, uh, is really large because uh, a lot of people like to, to swim in the morning and swim a lot. And uh, therefore we have a really a large pool. And uh, the pool has uh, every day 28 degrees. So it's, uh, it's not too cold and that's really perfect when you want to go to swim. And we have also a jacuzzi, that's, uh, this is a little bit warmer. It has uh, 36 degrees. It's really relaxful after skiing. Our speciality is from the sauna area. And uh, the ice grotto is a, is a room with uh, a lot of ice inside. So you can go after the sauna in and uh, you cool down there. We have standard treatments, so classical massages and uh, food reflexologies. And we have also special things like uh, Lomi Lomi Hawaiian massage and uh, also hot stones or uh, Abhyanga Indian massage. And uh, these are our specialities. And uh, we have a lot of uh, good medical therapists, so therefore we have also a lot of medical uh, treatments. When you come back from the skiing, then the best is uh, when you have a sportive massage because it's really hard and it's also good for the blood circulation and uh, for the relaxing. That's the best what you can have after the skiing. The unique and special thing about this hotel that is not only having an incredible history with a lot of repeat and regular clients coming for many years, being part of the history of the hotel. But it also offers you a, a tradition and, and a classical service with all the modern amenities you would expect from a five-star property. My favorite part of the hotel is the Sars Bar. Not only is there also some of the history um, in the hotel, but it's just a beautiful place for romantic evenings to have a drink um, together and there's a pianist playing there every evening to just get you in the mood. My favorite drink to have in the Stars Bar must be the espresso martini. Something you have to try. So after those lovely late night cocktails, it's bedtime in preparation for another day on the mountain. And remember that this high altitude takes a little while to get used to. But when you do, then maybe it's time to find some fresh Swiss powder snow. The off-piste is amazing, it's really amazing. We have glaciers, Sometimes we walk a little or we go heli skiing and we are places where there's no one, soft snow, fantastic scenery. But also within the ski area there's off-piste, a lot of off-piste even. You can ski through forests or just higher up or a little hidden place there, a little pool where there. It's lovely, it's really lovely. In a weather like this where it's cloudy and the visibility is not so strong and even little snowing is still very good. Usually we go in the lower areas, we go within the trees 
um, depending also on the skiers. There's steep piece in the trees, there's um, easier skis um, piece in the trees. The trees we choose for visibility reasons. If you are above the trees, you almost, well, you see your hand in front of your face, but not much further. But in the trees, it's almost like on a normal day. It's time for a pit stop. And here, nestled in a picturesque hamlet under the Matterhorn, you'll find true five-star mountain cuisine at the famous Zum Sea restaurant. Here, you can dine on fresh oysters and lobsters, either inside or out, while enjoying the first-class service of the Menig family. The old village itself is well worth an apre lunch visit. Zermatt has many world-class experiences to offer, and this one definitely fits straight into that category, as it's not every day you ski past a selection of igloos located directly on the ski trails. So pull up, get your skis off, and pop in for a quick glue vine to warm yourself, or maybe stay the night. Incredibly, some of the rooms even offer in-suite facilities. We have a hotel with uh, space for 34 people to sleep in here. We can eat in here, we, uh, we make a Swiss cheese fondue for the night. And we also have Igloo Suite with the private jacuzzi. And they can have a, a very nice night, a warm night in a sleeping bag together, close together. So far we had uh, 17 proposals in, uh, in the Igloo door and two marriage. On the daytime we have an outside bar so skier can come to our bar and have a glue wine, a homemade glue wine on our, on our bar. So this really is the perfect mountain chill out area where you can enjoy the intricate ice carvings created by the Igloo Dorf team. This year the team uses a medieval theme based on the French walled city Carcassonne. Well, sadly, it's time for us to head back down to the village and say farewell to Zermatt and its friendly people, as we are onward bound to find you the next best of the best of world-class locations and accommodation. Darling Island, Miller's Point, Circular Quay, all elements of the state capital of New South Wales in Australia. Welcome to Sydney. This modern brash city was the site of the first British colony in Australia and today has the highest population of the world's smallest continent. It's also one of the most multicultural cities in the world and so is often mistaken as the capital of Australia, which of course is Canberra. Sydney is the most expensive city in Australia, and with its warm summers from October to March, it becomes a playground for the world's jet-set travelers seeking fun, sun, and barbecues on the beach. As always on this series, we join some lucky couples and share their experiences in some of the world's finest hotels. Hotels that go beyond a five-star grading. Hotels that are really special. To find that quality of hotel in Sydney, we have chosen the Observatory Hotel. Right in the heart of the city, this hotel is geared for romance, business, and even family holidays. Children, for example, are given goldfish for the rooms for the duration of their stay. And there is a wide range of rooms. So let's give you the world-class grand tour. This boutique hotel, all spacious and elegant, the suites with custom-made furniture, 
antique fireplaces, and polished mahogany. In the bedroom, a magnificent four-poster bed with hand-carved posts and decorated in rose petals awaits honeymoon couples or is available simply on request. If four-poster beds aren't your style, then choose a junior suite with a relaxed sitting area of comfy sofas and full-sized armchairs. Most of the suites have balconies with views of the harbor or the city. But what really sells the hotel are its leisure facilities. This is the Observatory Spa Club, completely complimentary for guests. It is equipped with a gym, whirlpool, sauna, and steam rooms. Here you can book some of the most relaxing treatments in town, from full-bodied massages to this volcanic stone therapy. Or how about being energized and nourished from head to toe with a skin caviar cream massage? Why not simply relax under the twinkling stars of the Southern Hemisphere, recreated by fiber optics in this magnificent domed ceiling above the pool? The hotel prides itself on being a home away from home. Its public areas avoid the harshness often found in a hotel environment. And thanks to the colonial history of Sydney, the great British traditions are upheld in the city. This is a popular venue in the city. The lower corridors often echo with locals enjoying five-star cuisine at parties and weddings. With the relaxed ambience within the hotel, you should be well prepared for sightseeing and perhaps a little adventure. Adventure, of course, world-class style. This bird's eye view is a great way to familiarize yourself with the town. We have booked a 20 minute trip with Sydney's heat lens to the heart of the Koo Ring Guy Chase National Park for lunch. How's that for style? We have landed at a cottage restaurant called Point Inn in Coal and Candle Creek. The only way to arrive is by plane, boat, or, of course, simply in style. The restaurant's been here for about 30 years. I've been here for 15 years of that. Over the summertime, some of the vessels you see are incredible. You know, on this sort of waterway, it doesn't matter what sort of vessel you've got. It could be a canoe or a 120 metre yacht. It's just as beautiful. It's totally different than running a restaurant, say, in town with four walls and a window out onto the street. People normally are happy when they arrive, so it's not too hard to make them that little bit happier and get some gratification from your work. And we try and keep the dishes um, fairly fresh, not too much uh, overworking, not too many heavy sauces. Uh, and just keep it 
within seasonality as much as we can. Obviously with an emphasis on seafood, but we try and incorporate some game and meat dishes as well, so we hopefully keep as many people happy, happy as possible. For the more energetic, there are other ways of achieving a bird's eye view. Try climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge, for example. Just how high is it? Our guide, Ralph Langley, has the answer. 442 feet, a 40-storey building. That's how high we are. About, as we look down, 5.2 seconds above the water. Statistically, two climbers on every group will be seriously affected by height anxiety but in our training we are trained very thoroughly to sort of look after folks. If we can get them up onto the arch and they, they feel secure between the handrails, solid steel about three metres wide, generally we can get them all the way around and if we can do that they're just over the moon, they're just taking themselves out of their comfort zone, it's just awesome. And that's the job satisfaction, seeing the expressions on their faces. It's just brilliant. People just seem to love it up here. Well, as you can hear, they're cheering. I don't know whether it's because they recognise me or they're just happy to be up here, but they absolutely do adore it. They're at the top of the bridge, and, I mean, you'd have to be a hard marker not to be happy to be up here. It's an incredible bridge, a huge structural achievement. It was an achievement, nine years to build, 1923 to 1932. A gentleman called Dr John Bradfield lobbied for nearly 40 odd years to get the bridge up and running. He did many, many tours overseas, uh, looking at bridges in the UK, in Europe, in America, uh, to finally come up with this structure, this design, and to have the, the guile and resourcefulness to get it through uh, all the legislative sort of situations that they needed was just amazing. The Eiffel Tower, folks, has three million rivets. The Harbour Bridge has six million rivets. Twice as riveting as the Eiffel Tower. That's what we are. The Sydney Bridge overlooks one of the most famous natural harbours in the world. Although the view is fantastic, the best way to observe it, of course, is by sea. So, go rent a yacht. Even if you have never taken the helm before, with a little tuition and a half an hour or so, you will be cruising at 15 knots with the salty wind in your hair. Why does it seem so easy here? Skipper Gary Taylor has been teaching for 20 years. We've got hardly any tide here, we don't have fog. Um, it's very, very clear in terms of rocks and so forth. You can sail around this harbour and go nowhere near any rocks, any, any shoals, any sandbars, nothing like that. It's a magic place to sail. It doesn't take long with a skipper on board just to coach you as you go um, around the harbour. We're at Royal Yachting Association training or sailing school, so um, we can teach the same sort of program as they teach in, uh, in England and, and all through the Med, um, and that will take a bit longer. But just to get you up and running on a nice relaxing day with a, a few beers and a, a bit of champagne, some chicken as you cruise around, 15 minutes, half an hour, and you'll be able to sail on this boat. If you can sail yourself, um, it's a lot cheaper um, if you take out one of our smaller boats. Our smallest boat's about 33 feet Beneteau. Um, our biggest one's a 47 foot Beneteau. Um, so it just ranges from about, say, $600 up to, depending on how many people you have, a couple of thousand. Um, but the small small boats are fine for a couple. You can have up to six people, say. Really pleasant day on the harbour. Time for a change of scene and some more self-indulgence. We have taken a two-hour drive out of the hustle and bustle of the city to the Blue Mountains. 
named for the distinctive blue haze which is evident wherever you look. Some say this unique blue haze has been created by the rays of sunlight merging with the droplets of eucalyptus oil dispersed from the millions of eucalyptus trees. But in truth, it's simply particles within the atmosphere scattering the ultraviolet light when viewed over long distances. Sadly, the truth is rarely romantic. These sandstone rock plateaus, some with gorges 760 meters deep, reach, in some places, over a thousand meters above sea level, making it a little cooler here in the height of the Australian summer. The greater Blue Mountain area is vast, covering over a million hectares, and is mostly unnavigable. But here at Jameson Valley, there are great walking tracks and even a glass-bottomed railway car called the Scenic Skyway. But I think we've had enough of heights, don't you? Our accommodation is Lilienfels. Perched high on the cliff tops, it offers some of the best views of the valley. This five-star hotel is a real country retreat set in an historic country house amidst two acres of beautifully manicured gardens. It is a breathtaking escape for romantics, a delight for gourmets, and a wonder for lovers of nature, and of course, the Blue Mountains themselves. Lillianfels has won many awards, including the Best Boutique Hotel of the Year, as voted by the Australian Hotels Association in their national awards. In the comfort of these large and airy rooms, imagine opening your windows at night and sleeping with the cool, fresh mountain air. From crisp sheets and fluffy towels to the locally bottled mountain spring water, no detail has been overlooked. The rooms have views over the English-style gardens or of vast mountains and plunging valleys. Decorated in lush fabric, the sumptuous floral designs bring the outdoors in, inviting you to curl up and while the hours away. World Class has brought you here to see another award-winning spa. Their signature treatment is the Mandarin, Lime and Cranberry Body Scrub, designed to remove dead skin cells. Therapist Amanda Jones believes the treatment is an absolute must. For one, we look at skin care, but it's much deeper than that. It's a holistic approach, so it also treats um, spiritual and emotional issues. Because of the aromatherapy base, it encompasses all of those things. So they actually come in for a real therapeutic treatment and experience, and they walk out completely different. The body mud treatment starts with an oil application, an aromatic oil, and then we sprinkle a salt, and that's a desert salt mixed with um, some of the Australian native bush plants. It has various properties. It can be either for a dry skin um, or for somebody who suffers from anxiety or a little bit high strung, it can be for that. Or we can also use one which is from the lemon myrtle gum tree, which is uplifting and invigorating. The body is very intuitive, it knows what we need. So when the client comes in for their treatment, we actually have all of the products arrayed on a tray for them. And they touch and smell and feel the product and choose which one they are actually attracted to because the body's innate nature is to go for what it needs. So the client is really involved in the treatment as well and they get to learn a lot about the Aboriginal culture and the Aboriginal people and the philosophy behind the product as well as having a really amazing treatment.
So relaxed and rejuvenated, it's time to spend another day. Well, another day doing absolutely nothing. Go on, you deserve it. Simply unwind and let breakfast merge into afternoon tea. And then, because the food here is so special, why not let afternoon tea drift into your evening meal? Darley's restaurant has an old-fashioned and cozy feeling, and with its warm log fireplaces, dark wooden panels, stained glass windows, and crystal chandeliers, you could easily be in a stately English home. It's steeped in history, set in the heritage homestead of Frederick Darley, the sixth Chief of Justice of New South Wales, and so pays tribute to a bygone era. But it's the view at nighttime, and of course the food, that makes this restaurant so special. Executive chef Hugh Whitehouse grew up on a family farm, so his respect for fresh local produce was developed at a young age. His choice seasonal ingredients are sourced locally from a network of growers in the Blue Mountains. It's a new day and time for more relaxing activities. More quality time by the pool. Or perhaps playing a little snooker instead of pool. It's a new day, and a very early start is required to see these guys deep in the valley. It's so wonderful to see them in the wild, as opposed to a zoo. The hotel concierge can arrange wildlife treks and four-wheel drives, with guides brimming with knowledge of the Blue Mountains wildlife. Guides like Reg Prouse. This whole valley, uh, looking at it from here, is um, around uh, 800 metres deep. So it's an amazing uh, depth of valley and very old, looking around the 95 million years as a mountaintop that's been eroded away and carved out all this sand. Down the bottom of the valley is um, fairly dense, ancient rainforest and we're looking at cool temperate so we can have snow on this forest system which makes it a little unique. Uh, but koalas, kangaroos, um, you have all your typical Australian native animals, your wombats, lots of reptiles, so we've got all the big lizards, seven foot long, about two metres, and um, a good population of snakes. Being a local snake rescuer, we do about uh, probably 100 snake rescues a year, and um, most of those are in the venomous category, but they're all very friendly. If snakes are a concern, you don't have to venture too far to learn a little bit more about the flora and fauna of the region. The gardens boast some interesting plants that are challenging to grow, as Kylie Adams has discovered. I've been working here for just over 12 months. Um, I'm the head gardener here and I'm really enjoying it. The, the guest inquiries are just phenomenal. Everyone's interested in what you're doing. Um, I've been weeding or I've been pruning and I'll have people come up to me and say, can I have a go? It's just, it's amazing, it's really, it's really good. We can get quite cold in winter down to about minus eight, and we can also get up to about 36, 37 degrees in summertime. So it's quite a, a broad range of temperatures. It's very hard to try and find things that will tolerate growing in frosty conditions and also the hot in summer as well. So it's a, it's a good challenge. I look after all of our corporate events, weddings, and butler services and things like that. We want to give the guests something which is special, unique, and they can take it away, and that's what's important. So you've got to blend your butler service into what they're doing. You've got to know when to step back and when to come in, when to serve the champagne and discreetly make yourself scarce. 
and be ready with a glass of champagne when she says, yes, I will marry you. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for. But thanks to comments like that, this hotel gets our world-class stamp of approval, which proves that it's really staff that makes a hotel special. And you can rest assured that for the rest of the series, our team will continue to find the very best of hotels, with, of course, the very best of staff from around the globe.